välkomna allihopa till Apologia Live. Jag heter Martin Helgesson som hälsar er välkomna och som ska vara värd för den här kvällen. Och det är jättekul att se alla som ansluter. Roligt att läsa i chatten varifrån ni kopplar upp. Svårt att göra det samtidigt som jag hälsar er välkommen, men jag gör mitt bästa. Jättekul att se. Det ser ut som att vi också har ytterligare några som att vänta som har använt sig och ska vara med ikväll. Jätte, jätteroligt. We are very excited to have Andy Bannister with us. And Andy, you are joining us here on screen. Perfect. Uh, Andy Hi. is the director. I am indeed. Hello. So hello from <laughs> England, Martin, and everyone on the webinar. Great to be with you this evening. And I'm very relieved that your English is better than my Swedish by a long way. Well, uh, well, let's hope so. Uh, but but um, I do know that you have a, a, a have a special relationship to Sweden, Andy. Why don't you uh, explain that to us? And I I have a, I have sort of a vague memory of you once writing a book uh, claiming Sweden didn't exist. Am didn't I right? Exist. That's right. Well, my my book on atheism, uh, Martin, that is that is actually available in in Swedish. I tried to find the Swedish translation on the shelf somewhere here, and I could only find the Norwegian one. I'm I'm very sorry, but the oh, atheist that's quite exist. offensive. <laughs> yeah, the this was originally going to be called "Why Sweden Doesn't Exist" and other curious problems for atheism. But my publisher thought that was a bit too off the wall, a bit too surreal, so we went for the atheist who didn't exist. But yes, in the second chapter. Uh, there's, I, there's a whole little joke built around, you know, what you would do with someone who denied that Sweden existed. And I have a personal connection. You are absolutely right in that my uh, my wife, we've been married for 25 years, and she is uh, one quarter Swedish, one quarter Norwegian and half English. So and she has a Swe she has a Swedish passport. So we have a strong affinity uh, for Sweden here. We celebrated Swedish uh, style on Christmas Eve a few weeks ago. So yes, Sweden is a big part of our kind of family and culture. We've got lots of family uh, over there on your side of the North Sea in in Stockholm, particularly. So it's a country we we love very much. Well, well, great. And we've had you here for a conference a few years back, and uh, we're happy to have you uh, joining us uh, over Zoom uh, tonight. So why don't you, Andy, uh, start by by sharing a little bit about what you do uh, with uh, with Solas and so on, and. Uh, And then let's dive into tonight's topic about uh, talking talking about Jesus without looking like an idiot. Yeah, fantastic. If it's okay with you, Martin, I'll just go from one straight to the other. And while you were doing the introduction, I managed to get the technology working. So I think I should be able to switch very neatly into, yes, there we are. We actually have my slides up and running. Fantastic. So uh, again, good evening, uh, everybody. As, uh, as you heard, uh, and you know, my name is Andy Bannister, and I lead... Uh, I lead an organization here uh, in the UK uh, called SOLAS, and uh, SOLAS is the Scottish word, uh, the Gaelic word for light, because uh, originally we were, we were a Scottish organization, we now cover the whole of the UK. And really two things that, that SOLAS focuses on, it's a Scottish word for, for light, and we focus really on two things. Firstly, uh, taking the light of the message of Jesus uh out of the ball walls of the churches and so we do events in everything from you know coffee shops to cafes restaurants universities schools workplaces uh you name it so we take the message of jesus into those spaces and then the other thing that we love doing is helping uh equip christians to think uh about how they can share their faith in jesus with their friends and their neighbors and their colleagues and to do so in a way that is winsome and persuasive and engaging and so on. But I haven't always been uh, in full-time Christian ministry. I have since about 2010, uh, so about 14, 15 years. But my first job, my first ever career, uh, was working for the health service uh, here uh, in, the, in the UK. And I worked for a large teaching hospital uh, in London, the town where I, the city where I'd grown up. And I worked for St. George's Hospital, um, helping them organize medical conferences. And I worked there about six or seven years. And I absolutely adored my time uh, working there in the 1990s. It was a fantastic job, really enjoyed it. But looking back, uh, I feel some not inconsiderable guilt that during my time uh, working uh, for the health service in the UK, working for the hospital, I was very much uh, an undercover Christian. I have long thought 
but Undercover Christian would make a great title for a movie about Christians sneaking around, <clears throat> hoping that their colleagues, uh, their friends of their university don't actually discover they are Christian. What do I mean by Undercover Christian? Though? Well, what I mean by that is outside of work, I was involved in all kinds of Christian activities. I was active in my local church, a very active, involved Christian. But inside work, inside the hospital, I took my, my little light of faith and I put it under a bowl and I put the bowl inside a box and I surrounded the box by, by blackout curtains. Um, and I wasn't alone in this, incidentally. Um, after I'd worked for the, the, the hospital for about six or seven years, uh, they threw me a little leaving lunch. I had actually announced I was leaving. If your workplace throw you a leaving lunch and you haven't resigned, they are trying to send you a message. Um, but I had resigned and they threw me a leaving lunch. And I discovered at this leaving lunch that a lady who had worked on the same corridor as me, about six doors down, for almost the same length of time as I'd been there, uh, I discovered she was also a Christian, but she too had also been playing undercover Christian. She'd kept quiet about her faith. And so neither of us knew that we had a committed Christian on the same corridor. So looking back now at my time in the in the secular workplace, you know, I do find myself asking, what was I afraid of? What was I afraid of? And what's a, what, are the, what are other Christians afraid of when it comes to talking about their faith at places like work? Because lots of surveys and studies have shown that fear is the number one thing holding a lot of Western Christians back from talking about our faith at work, at school, uh, university, and so on. Well, I think if you'd asked the 25-year-old me why I didn't talk about Jesus more often, I think I'd have said things like, well, I'm afraid of looking stupid. You know, what happens if I try and talk about Jesus at work and I look like an idiot? I think I might have been even more spiritual, perhaps. I might have said, well, I'm afraid of making God look bad. You know, what if I do such a terrible job of evangelism uh, that actually it scares people off wouldn't it be better if i just said nothing i think i would have said i'm afraid of standing out from the crowd you know workplaces and universities can be very conformist environments where everyone's pressured to look the same and being a christian you stand out and that probably terrified me i think i'd have said what about the implications for my career you know, what if identifying as a Christian and talking about Jesus gets me into all kinds of trouble or difficult conversations and that impacts my career? You know, would that be a problem? And then I think I'd also have said to you back then, what if I'm asked a question I can't answer? What if I say I'm a Christian and one of my colleagues says, oh, you're a Christian, right? OK, what about science? What about suffering? What about sexuality? What about a topic that begins with a letter other than the letter S? I mean, how... How terrible would that be? And over the years, I've come to realize that those fears on that slide, those fears that held me back in the workplace, actually hold lots of Christians back in the workplace. I meet so many folks who are afraid, who are nervous about talking about their faith at work. Uh, they feel that evangelism isn't for ordinary people. You know, it's a very, very widespread issue in the church. Many, many Christians, I think, are afraid of evangelism. And then what happens is we end up feeling guilty or foolish or inadequate because of that. And that makes things even worse. So how do we overcome those those fears? That was what interested me when I set out to write the book that we're talking about in some senses this evening, the book, How to Talk About Jesus Without Looking Like an Idiot. How do we overcome some of those fears that I've talked about and others? Well, my family and I have lived in the UK for about the last uh, eight years. And uh, before that, we lived uh, in Toronto, um, in Canada. We lived there for about six years and doing a similar kind of work to the work I do here. And very shortly after I moved to Canada in 2010, uh, I, I met a uh, Christian, I became a good friend of mine, his name was Peter. And Peter was a family doctor and a very committed Christian. And very early on in one of our conversations, Peter said to me, he said, Andy, I love being a Christian and a doctor because there are so many wonderful opportunities for evangelism. Now, this my ears pricked up because I don't know how, how it is in, in Sweden, uh, but here in the UK and in Canada where I was, it is very, very hard if you are a doctor or a nurse or a teacher to talk publicly about your faith in the workplace. You can get in all kinds of trouble. In fact, there was a story in our UK newspapers uh, about this time last year 
uh, where a Christian doctor had merely offered to pray with a patient. A complaint had been made and he almost lost his job over that incident. So when Peter said to me he was uh, he was he was he was very excited about being a Christian and being a doctor, I said, well, tell me more about this. He said, well, it's amazing. He said, I've I've prayed with patients. I've shared my faith with patients. I've even had the privilege of leading patients to faith right there in my surgery. And I again, I was startled. I said, OK, Peter, what are you doing that has enabled you to do this without getting into trouble? Because I meet so many Christian doctors and nurses and teachers and other professionals who are just afraid and prefer to say nothing. And when I asked him that question, he he laughed and he said, actually, it's really simple, Andy. And then he said, he told me what he did. He said, when I have a, a patient in my surgery who is going through some kind of struggle in their life, he said, I'll take that patient on a little bit of a life audit. So I'll say to them, tell me about your diet. Are you, are you eating well? I'll, I'll ask them, I'll say to them, tell me about your exercise regime. Are you exercising properly? Tell me about your sleep. Are you sleeping properly? And then Peter said, the last question, <coughs> excuse me, I will always ask, the last question I will always ask is tell me about spirituality. Are you making place for that in your life? And he said, you know, what, Andy, normally what happens is the patient will then say, spirituality, what do you mean, doctor? And uh, Peter will say, well, you know, some people meditate, some people do yoga. I'm a Christian, so I read the Bible, I pray, I go to church, those kind of things. And he said, do you know, in easily 90% of cases, the patient then asks a follow-up question. You know, you pray, doctor, or why would you do that? Or, or you go to church, what's all that about? And he said, the great thing is they are now asking him the question, and he is infinitely freer to talk about his faith because the patient is driving it. It's the patient who is driving the conversation. And uh, Peter has been doing that now for about 30 years, has had hundreds, if not thousands of conversations uh, with patients. He's seen people come to Christ. He's prayed with people and not a single complaint. He has never got into trouble and he's still doing it as far as I know there in Toronto. And the key to Peter's approach, when he told me that story, it was like a light bulb went on in my brain because I was like what he is doing I thought is brilliant because he's discovered the power of questions. Peter had stumbled across the power of questions and I think questions are one of the most powerful evangelistic tools we have available to us yet they are one of the most overlooked and the idea of using questions in evangelism is not is not a new one it's not wasn't invented by my friend Peter it certainly wasn't invented by me it goes actually all the way back to the master question asker himself it goes back to Jesus somebody has counted and calculated that Jesus asks I believe it is 307 questions in the gospels um, if you have the, a, the chance sometime it's really interesting to sit down of an evening or a, a Saturday afternoon and read through Mark's gospel the shortest gospel in the New Testament and just make a note in the margin of your Bible every time that Jesus asks a question he does it all over the place. And so what I'd like to do is share with you two examples from the Gospels of Jesus doing this. And then I'm going to teach you some questions that you yourself can use. A couple, the first two I'm going to teach you are really good if you're in a conversation and someone raises a tricky issue. But more importantly, in the age that we live in today, the third question I'm going to teach you, the one I'm the most excited about in my book, is all is designed to start spiritual conversations with people who would say, I'm just not interested in faith. But let's start with the master question asker and have a look at Jesus. And I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 22, where we read this story. Matthew tells us that the Pharisees went out and they laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You are not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. So tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Well, as you probably are aware, first century Israel was an occupied land. It was occupied by the Romans, and the Romans were considered by most pious Jews to be evil, occupying oppressors. So if you paid your tax, you were collaborating with the enemy. On the other hand, if you didn't pay your tax, the Romans considered that to be an act of uh, sedition, of rebellion, and it could quickly lead to arrest, torture and execution. So the Pharisees are probably thinking to themselves, this is a brilliant, brilliant trap 
that we've sprung on Jesus, because if he says yes or he says no, we've got him either way. And I often think it's interesting, right? We're worried that talking about Jesus at work might get us fired. Jesus is faced with a challenge that if he gives the wrong answer, he might get executed or lynched. So how does Jesus answer? Well, I personally, every time I read this story, I, I do wish he'd said no. Wouldn't it be brilliant if Jesus had said, you must never pay tax? Because I'm sure we could write to our governments at the end of every uh, tax year and just ask for a refund on our taxes. We could quote Jesus and, you know, the Swedish government, the UK government would send their money back to us. I'm sure that's what would happen. But if Jesus had said no, you mustn't pay tax, he'd have been arrested on the spot. If he'd said yes, pay your tax, he'd be morally compromised. You see, this question is not really about economics. It's actually about compromise. And so in that light, Jesus' answer is very, very clever. And it uses the question. Jesus, we read on, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this? Whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. So, Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. By asking that seemingly innocent little question about the coin, whose who's face, whose image is on this coin? Jesus is, opens up the ability to redefine and reorientate the conversation in such a way that he's then able to basically say, you know, it's fine to pay taxes when they're appropriate, just get on and do it. But the real issue, the really important issue, is what we give to God. I often wonder what would have happened if one of Jesus, one of Jesus's questioners in the crowd had turned around and said, well, OK, Rabbi, what belongs to God? I wonder if Jesus might have asked another question. Whose image is on you? Well, using a question like Jesus did to, to clarify an issue, to focus an issue, has lots of contemporary applications. Let's take Jesus's method and apply it in today's world. So let's imagine this scenario. Imagine that you're uh, sitting eating lunch in the staff canteen, the staff restaurant at lunchtime at the place you work, or if you're a university student, you're there on campus in the cafeteria, and you're minding your own business when suddenly one of your colleagues, you know, looks up from their phone uh, across the table at you, looks at you and says, oh, you're still into that Christianity thing, aren't you? Tell me, do you think abortion is wrong. To your horror, they've asked this question really loudly, and you can sense all the other conversations around you in the cafe die away. You will sense, you know, the sound of a dozen pairs of eyes swiveling as other people on other tables lean in to hear what you're going to say to your friend or your colleague. You now your heart is racing, your palms are, are sweaty, you are praying silently for the fire alarm to sound so you can get out of this hot spot, uh, but no luck. So what do you say? Well, of course, the simple answer from Christian ethics is to say, yes, abortion is wrong. But if you simply say, yes, abortion is wrong, what is your friend and everyone else in the cafe going to think? Are they going to think this is the wisest, the most thoughtful, the most informed, informed, the most progressive answer I've ever heard? Pray tell me from where did you get this wisdom? Or are they instead going to think words like bigot, narrow-minded, uh, judgmental, and so on and so forth. You see, the problem is, in the eyes of our non-Christian friends, the abortion issue that I use as, as my example here is always, is always about choice. And of course, we have words for people who deny other people a choice. We call them fascists, dictators, oppressors, and so forth. But here's a thought. If answering the question you've been asked is going to give the wrong impression of God, the wrong impression of the gospel and the wrong impression of you, maybe there is something wrong with the question. And you see, for us as Christians, this question is all about life. So what about if you took the Jesus approach and responded with a question? What if you turned to your friend and said, well, thank you for, for asking a brilliant question. But I wonder, uh, to help me answer it, I wonder if I might first ask you a question. And my question is this. Can you tell me, when do you think it's OK to take a, the life of a wholly innocent person? Under what circumstances do you think it's OK to, to kill an innocent person? Well, unless you're having lunch with a, with a psychopath, in which case just get out of the cafe as quick as you can, um, your colleague will respond, well, it's never, it's never OK. 
to take the life of an innocent person. And then you can say that's really helpful because now we can talk about what really matters. What is it that's in the womb? Is it just a collection of, of atoms or is it a life? Because as you yourself have just said, we can't just take a life and, and kill it uh, if that life is wholly innocent. Now, look, asking a question like that doesn't guarantee that the person is going to uh, affirm everything that you say, but it does open up the chance that you will have a more substantial conversation. And if you don't do this, people aren't going to hear sanctity of life. They're going to hear restriction of choice. But if we ask questions, we can clarify and create space to identify the real issues. Because as somebody once remarked, the right answer to the wrong question is always unhelpful. Well, let's look at a second example from Jesus' ministry. And then, as I say, I will teach you three questions that you can take away this evening and try out for yourselves in a whole variety of circumstances. But let's take one more look at Jesus. And this time we're going to go to Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 10, where we have the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler. So Mark tells us, as Jesus started on his way, man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus replied, no one is good except God alone. Now we'll stop the story there. And I wonder as you've heard this story before, because I'm sure this is not the first time this evening uh, you've come across this story. I wonder if you find yourself thinking, what a particularly strange response Jesus makes here. I mean, Jesus was fond of doing things that provoked people and made people think. This has to be high on the list of the most curious. Um, and the sign that it's a strange response is I bet none of us here would use this. You know, if uh, an hour or two later this evening, you're sitting on the on the couch, drinking a coffee, watching TV, when suddenly there's a knock at the door, you get up, you go to the front door, you open the door and it's your next door neighbor. And they say to you, good Christian, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I bet nobody on this webinar is going to say, why do you call me good? You're probably going to say, come on in, the kettle's on. I'd love to answer that question. Maybe if you're a bit more nervous, you might get a book or a, or a leaflet or a, or a blog or a, or, a, or a podcast to watch or listen to. And if you're a real coward, maybe you'll say, I'll tell you what, come to church with me on Sunday and I'll get the pastor to answer that question. But none of us are going to use this response. So why does Jesus use it? Why doesn't Jesus just reply, I'm the son of God, follow me? Well, maybe there was something that Jesus had to do before this young man is ready to listen to him. You see, think about this for a moment. Uh, if imagine that you were to take a, a non-Christian friend or a colleague, maybe a, a workmate, a classmate, a friend, a neighbor, family member, somebody who's not a Christian, and you were to say to your friend, look, I want you to imagine for a moment that there is a God. I know you don't believe in God, but just imagine with me that there is for a moment. And I want you to imagine that there's, there's a heaven. Again, I know you don't believe in, in heaven, but just pretend with me for the moment. Now, imagine there's a God, imagine there's a heaven. What do you think you would need to do to get there? Now, what's interesting is most people give the same answer to that question. Most people answer, well, I guess I would be a good person if there were a God and there were a heaven. If I live a good life, I'm a decent person, then I guess if God and heaven existed, I'd have a chance of getting in. And this is what this young man is saying to Jesus. He's saying, well, Jesus, you look like a good person. So you're clearly going to heaven. Um, so tell me, how do I get there? And so this is the mess that Jesus has to deal with. And he could deal with it with a sermon, a parable, uh, a, clever, a clever statement. He does it with a question. Because when Jesus turns to the young man and says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. He's basically saying to the young man, you know, you're absolutely right. All good people do go to heaven. But the problem is only God is good. So if all good people go to heaven, but only God is good, who gets to go? Only God. Uh, and I'm afraid you're application to join the trinity has been turned down this evening by the way it also opens up another issue doesn't it if the young man has seen that jesus is good and only god is good who exactly does that make jesus and of course as you read on in this story the next thing that happens is this young man turns out to have lots of money and jesus looks at him and says sell it all give it all away and come and follow me and demand that doesn't really make sense if jesus is just another jewish rabbi and Jesus opens up all of that by simply asking a question. Questions can be incredibly helpful, incredibly powerful. And so, as I say, what I'd like to do now is share with you three questions 
uh, that uh, that you can use in a whole variety of uh, of settings. Um, and the questions I'm going to I'm going to walk you through are the questions: What do you mean by that? Why do you think that? And have you ever wondered? The first two are not particularly original to me. I can think of at least four or five other people who've covered similar terrain over the years, including C.S. Lewis years ago. But the "Have you ever wondered?" question. Uh, is one that's uh, that hasn't been covered that much of late, and is I think one of the most important questions in the age that we we find ourselves in. But let's start with those that first question on the list and show you how it works. Let me take the "What do you mean by that?" question and uh, and illustrate it with a with an example. So I want you to imagine that you are maybe tomorrow, maybe the next on the weekend, that you're riding the bus uh, somewhere in the town, the city where you live. You're on on the bus going to work, going shopping. Uh, somewhere like that on the bus and like every christian on public transport you are reading the biggest blackest leather bound bible you can possibly get your hands on it is absolutely massive no sneaky reading the bible on a phone for you and there you are reading your huge bible and who should get on at the next bus stop but an old school friend who you haven't seen for about 10 years and your friend gets onto the bus stop, sits down next to you, looks at you, sees the Bible. They couldn't really miss it. It is so big. And your friend immediately says, oh, you're not still into that religion rubbish, are you? Only idiots believe in God. There is it's totally irrational. Uh, there is no evidence that God exists, period. And you notice something at this point. You firstly, you notice you remember that they used to do this kind of stuff 10 years ago. That's why they're an old friend. You also notice they've been so loud that everyone else on the bus has stopped their conversations and is listening to yours. People are taking their earphones out and are listening in to what's going to go on here. And you've got maybe three minutes to your bus stop. Again, your heart is racing. Your palms are a bit sweaty. What do you do faced with everything that's been just thrown at you? Well, maybe rather than try and launch into a you know three minute lecture on five philosophical evidences for the existence of God. What about if you use the what do you mean by that question? What if you turn to your friend and said, well, thank you for um, uh, for that. But I just uh, have a question. Uh, when you say only idiots believe in God, what do you mean by that? After all, there are many brilliant men and women, uh, uh, you know, experts in their field, uh, you know, great minds uh, today and through history who have believed in God. What particularly is it that you think is idiotic about believing in God? Uh, you might pick up on the word evidence. You might say to your friend, hey, you said there's no evidence that God exists. What do you mean by that word evidence? What would count as evidence for you? What would you need to see or, or hear or read to make you perhaps consider maybe there might be something to the whole God question? And by the way, you might pick up on the word God. Uh, you might say to your friend, hey, you mentioned the word God uh, a few times in what you just said. What do you mean by that? When you say God, what do you mean? I've asked atheist friends that and sometimes been told, well, I don't believe in the in the guy who lives in the sky with a great big beard and the lightning bolts, to which I always like to say, well, that's a relief. I mean, that sounds like, a, you know, a, 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 a mashup of Father Christmas and Thor. And I don't believe in anything so daft as that. Um, may I tell you what I do believe in? And sometimes those conversations have gone in interesting directions. And any of those approaches, picking up on something that your friend has said and simply unpacking it uh, with a what do you mean by that question? opens up the, the increases the probability that you might have a conversation here not some crazy argument and success for me would look like when you get off the bus in in three minutes time you being able to say to your friend hey this has been a fascinating conversation why don't next time you're in town we have a coffee and talk a bit more so that's the what do you mean by that question let's move on and look uh, quickly at the why do you think that question which works in a very similar way um, but again, we'll use a little bit of scenario here. So let's imagine that this time you are um, you are in the workplace and uh, in your office. And let's imagine that if, if you were, perhaps you work in an open plan office, let's say for this example, and you're sitting working away at your desk as a Monday morning. And like every Christian in a secular workplace there at your desk in front of you, you have your laptop computer, uh, your coffee and the biggest, blackest, leather bound Bible you could possibly get your hands on. Every Christian in the workplace carries one of those, right? And you're busy working away at your desk, minding your own business, doing a spreadsheet or something. Uh, when a shadow falls across your desk as a colleague walks by and your colleague glances across at you and says, oh, for goodness sake, why would you bring a Bible into an office? I mean, for goodness sake, no one believes the Bible today. It's an Iron Age book. It's full of myths and legends. And besides, it is riddled full of contradictions. Now, again, you notice a couple of things. Firstly, you notice they have said this so loudly 
but everybody else in your open plan office is leaning around their computers, looking at you thinking this is going to be a very interesting five minutes. You also notice that this is not just any colleague who has said this. This is a senior manager. So if you get rather sort of overly uh, confident in reply, you may score 10 out of 10 for evangelism, but you might fail your next performance review. So what do you do? Well, again, this is where the why do you think that question can be very helpful. Maybe you could look at your colleague and say, well, again, thank you for what you've uh, just shared there. I've heard other people say similar things, but I just wonder if I might ask you a question. What is it that you've you've read or or seen or, or heard that's led you to those uh, that view you just shared about the Bible? In other words, your friend, your colleagues advanced uh, a proposition and you are very gently, very politely ask them to justify it. And by the way, there is every chance your colleague may say something in reply like, well, everybody knows, which is shorthand for, I've got no idea. I just saw, you know, Richard Dawkins say it on YouTube yesterday, uh, and you've challenged them and put them on the spot, and you've done that very politely. Um, or you might pick up the word contradictions. You might say, hey, you said there are contradictions in the Bible. That interested me. Um, when you've been, when you've read the Bible, um, what contradictions have you come across that have given you, given you trouble? Again, you've gently asked, why do you think that? And again, one of two things will happen. Either they won't actually have anything, which is interesting. Or, and this was the fear that held me back when I worked in the, in the health service. What if your colleague says, OK, what about? And they give an example. Well, here's the thing. If you know the answer to the Bible difficulty they've raised, then just politely share it. You don't need to be aggressive. You can just say, that's a really good question. But I wonder if you've considered and share what you know. If you don't know the answer, and as I say, this was the fear that kept me quiet at the hospital. I was afraid of being asked a question I couldn't answer. Then you simply say to your colleague, do you know, that's a really good question. And look, I'm a Christian who likes to be thought through. Uh, leave that with me. Let me go and find the answer to that for you. And then be true to your word. You know, read a book, do an internet search. There are lots of great apologetics websites out there. Talk to an older, wiser Christian, a pastor or someone you know who's more experienced, find the answer to your colleague's question, because then you have a wonderful opportunity next time you see him or her, you know, to go up to them and say, hey, thank you for that really good question you raised in the office last week. I really appreciated it because it made me do some work and I found the answer to your, your excellent question. Would you be interested in hearing it? Now you might get a door slammed in your face, but if you've been polite and, uh, and winsome and friendly, there's every chance your colleagues say, well, okay, what have you got? And uh, you can share what you discovered. And the why do you think that question is a great way, again, of turning what otherwise me but might be an argument into a conversation. But of course, what if your colleagues are not throwing anti-Christian remarks around the office? Uh, well, this is where the last question that I want to land on in my last kind of seven or eight minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A, uh, rides the rescue. And I say it's one of my favourite questions uh, in the current culture we live, at, live in, the have you ever wondered question, because it is brilliant for helping us if when we have friends or colleagues who appear to be utterly disinterested in spiritual things. The have you ever wondered question lets you start spiritual conversations in all kinds of settings. And to show you how it works, rather than sort of use a made up funny example, let me tell you a real story. I have a friend who is a uh, religious studies uh, and philosophy teacher in a high school in the south of England. And as a Christian teaching in a secular school, uh, John has to be very careful how direct he is about his faith, particularly with the students, but also with his fellow teachers. But he has found that if he asks wondering questions, all kinds of amazing things can happen. On one occasion, he told me he was teaching a class of 15 year old students. He was teaching them a class on ethics and to illustrate a point about human rights. He put up this uh, cover of Time magazine from the 9th of August 2010 on the screen. That's a very famous cover, actually. It won photojournalism awards at the time, and it portrays the beautiful but mutilated face of a young girl called Bibi Asia. Who was she? Well, she was a 14 year old Afghan teenager who was forcibly married off to a Taliban warlord in his 50s. He proceeded to horribly abuse and mistreat her. She ran away from the family home, was captured, uh, dragged back, and her nose and her ears were cut off and they left her to die in the mountains. Thankfully, she was rescued by United Nations aid workers, flown to the West, given reconstructive surgery. And if you looked her up today, uh, you would find she is living a very different life indeed. But it's a very powerful story. 
And John told the story. And then he asked his class of 15 year olds. He said, OK, who here thinks that what was done to Bibi Asia was wrong? He said to me, Andy, thankfully, every hand in the class shot up. He said it is never a good day as a teacher when you discover a psychopath at the back of the class. Every hand went up. So John then asked the follow up question. He said, OK, why is it wrong? He said this time there was a lot more silence before one student raised her hand and said, well, it's just not right, Mr. Broadbanks. They, they violated her human rights. They violated her human rights. And John said, that's a wonderful answer, Sarah. Wonderful answer. OK, why is that wrong? Why is it wrong to violate somebody's human rights? And John said for the next five or ten minutes, the kids would make suggestions and he would simply ask, why? Why is that the case? Finally, one kid in frustration calls out, well, it's just wrong, sir. I can't tell you why, but it's just wrong. And John then said, just wrong. Interesting. Have you ever wondered what is so special about human beings that we have these magical sets of things called rights that mean that it's wrong if you do things to us? What is magical about human DNA such that we have these rights and privileges that we don't assign to, to other things in biology. Have you ever wondered about that? It was a bit of a discussion. And at the end of that, he was able to ask another question. He said, you know, have you wondered, you know, when it comes to human rights, if maybe what we think about bigger things like God, for example, really matter? See, I wonder that if we believe, if you believe in some kind of God, it's much easier to make sense of human rights because you can say God gave us rights and dignity. On the other hand, if you're an atheist and you believe that human beings are just biology and chemistry and physics, then it makes very difficult. It's very difficult to make sense of human rights. So I wonder if you've thought about that. Well, not merely did that use of a wandering question uh, open up lots of conversation with the students. It also opened up an amazing conversation with one of his fellow teachers, his head of department, who had been at the back of the class observing the lesson that day. Uh, this fellow teacher, who was a self-described agnostic, a man who would have said, I'm not interested in God, don't talk to me about God, doesn't interest me. This teacher came up to John at the afternoon tea break, him sort of bouncing up to him in the staff uh, cafe and said, John, that was an amazing discussion you just led with the students back in that class. It had never before occurred to me that human rights is a totally stupid idea if there is no God. To which John said, well, I don't think I was quite that blunt, that direct with the students, but yes, uh, pretty much so. His colleague then said, you know, I, uh, I had never quite realised how many things stand or fall on the existence of God in some ways. Maybe I should think more about some of this stuff sometime. And again, John said that would be an amazing uh, thing. I agree. And then even better, his colleague then added after they chatted a bit further, his colleague said to him, Do you know, I confess I've tried to ignore the God question for many years. I've kind of tried to push it under the bed and forget about it. Maybe maybe it's time I took a proper look at it. To which John said that I think would be a marvellous idea and I would love to buy you a, you know, a sandwich or a cup of coffee sometime and we can have that conversation. And John did that just by asking wandering questions. Have you wondered in this case about human rights? But we can ask wandering questions about so many other things that our friends and neighbours and colleagues and classmates care about. For example, have you ever wondered why justice matters at all if we're just atoms and particles? Human rights is one thing, but justice in itself, why does it matter if human beings are just molecules? Have you ever wondered why beauty and art move us powerfully if our only purpose is survival and reproduction? What is it? What on earth is going on with the human response to, to beauty, be it in a natural landscape or in a painting or a photograph? Have you ever wondered while we get upset about greed, we live, in a, we live in cultures where greed is frowned upon and selfishness is looked down upon. But why is that? Again, uh, if we live in a godless universe, um, why, surely the person who dies with the most stuff has won the game of life. Have you ever wondered uh, why uh, greed upsets us? And in short, the have you ever wondered question, what it does is it takes things our friends already care about. Justice, beauty, meaning, truth. And we ask our friends and our colleagues, have you ever wondered what the source of these things is? Have you wondered why they matter to us? And it's a very gentle way of starting spiritual conversations. And by the way, if you want a biblical example of this, go read Acts chapter 17, Acts 17 
verse 16 and onwards sometime. That's Paul in Athens, where he comes across the statue to the, the, the altar to the unknown God. And he basically asks a wandering question. Have you ever wondered about this thing that you're worshipping? And by the way, little plug, we have a new book uh, coming through Solas uh, next year. You can go to the Solas website. The URL is there and put H-Y-E-W. Have you ever wandered in to find that? And that, that book has 30 chapters written by 10 different authors. And it's a brilliant evangelistic book designed to be given to non-Christian friends. And there's chapters in there asking wandering questions about everything from music and art to the sciences to justice, law, uh, history, the list goes on, designed to get people thinking uh, about spirituality. So three questions uh, in conclusion. Have you ever, what, what do you mean by that? Have you ever wondered? And uh, and why do you think that? And I really believe if we learn to ask good questions, uh, we can open up space among our friends and in our workplaces for sharing answers. And then we illustrate a story about how this can work too in the in the real world. I remember speaking uh, a couple of years ago uh, at, a, at a breakfast event for a local church. They put on an event and uh, they'd put on a breakfast in a cafe. People had invited their friends and they'd asked me to come and speak on the pursuit of happiness. Have you ever wondered if we look for uh, the right things in all the wrong places or the title largely like that? And I often do that topic, the pursuit of happiness in kind of secular settings. And before the event began, I got talking to a man who'd arrived early and I asked him why he came today. And he said, oh, a, a, Christi a Christian friend had, uh, had invited him. And he said the, the topic of, of happiness, he said it really interested me. So I was happy to come. I said, oh, tell me, um, why did the why did the topic interest you? What was it about happiness as a topic that fascinated you? He said, well, let me tell you a bit of my story, Andy. He said, for the for the last eight years, he said, I've been working two jobs, working two jobs and taking incredible amounts of overtime, working almost every hour I had spare. He said, because my dream was to pay the mortgage on my house, the debt on my house off years early. I thought that was the best gift I could give to my family. And he said, you know, last month, I achieved the dream. I walked into the bank. I wrote the last check. I signed the paperwork. I paid off my house 10 years early. He said, I thought this would be the happiest day of my life. I've been living for it for eight years. But he said, Andy, do you know what? It was the most miserable day of my life. I said, why? He said, because I walked out of the bank with no idea what I was now supposed to be doing. I felt totally empty. I realized the, the thing I've been chasing after wasn't the right thing. And then he said this to me, he said, what happens if you've spent your entire life climbing the ladder and you only discover that you're leaning the ladder against the wrong building? He said, that's why I've come to this talk. So I hope you're going to answer the question. And uh, we had a great conversation afterwards, too. You see, I think many of our friends are asking questions like that, questions about happiness and meaning, purpose, identity, beauty, justice, human rights, the list goes on. And so my prayer for each one of you on this webinar this evening is that you would by the power of the spirit, have the boldness to ask good questions. Start great conversations, point your friends and your neighbours and your colleagues to Jesus as you do it. Because it was Jesus, of course, who said, I have come that they might have life and they might have it to the full. Thanks for listening. And uh, Martin, back to you. I think that's it. Let's uh, let's dive into the pile then of questions. And we have an anonymous one at the top of the pile here. Uh, should we avoid talking about judgment and hell while evangelizing? Oh, what an absolutely brilliant question. So thank you, whoever asked that anonymously. I'd let me say a couple of things that we do need to talk about judgment at some point, right? Because on the journey to somebody becoming a Christian, you know, you somebody at some point is going to have to confront the fact that the message of Jesus identifies the fact that we are we are sinners, uh, that we fall short of the glory of God, and we need we need God's love and forgiveness through Christ in order to be won back into relationship with Him. So that is an end point on my conversation with somebody. What we need to figure out is how to get there. And I think one of the challenges is Sweden, uh, like the UK, like Europe as a whole, we are largely post-Christian societies. So if you start with kind of judgment and hell, people are going to have no framework to understand that. Most people have a totally, you know, misunderstanding of hell, for example, if they thought about it at all, it will be, you know, sort of images of medieval art and demons of pitchforks and so forth. Um, talk about judgment, unless you first understand who, who God is and his character, none of that makes sense. So I wouldn't start there, but I would weave that in 
potentially at some point. And interestingly, that book that I mentioned, the Have You Ever Wondered book, uh, that's coming out in in a few months, a couple of months' time. Uh, we've arranged the the, the 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 chapters in there. They start very gently. Towards the end, we begin nudging towards topics of judgment. Like we've got a chapter that called "Have You Ever Wondered If You're a Good Person?" Uh, because we play, you know, playing with the idea. We live in a culture where people want to think they are good people. Well, what if you're not a good person? What actually if you are not the person you think you are? And then one of the penultimate chapters is is called uh, "Have You Ever Wondered What God Thinks of You?" Um, and I think those are interesting ways in. So those type of questions in a conversation warm somebody up to spirituality, talk a bit about God and who he is. And then interesting, those kind of questions. Who do you know? What if there were a God? What do you think he would think of you is an interesting question. You get some interesting answers. I've had people say to me, well, God would not want nothing to do with me. I had a family mm -hmm. friend, family member once say that to me. Well, God would want nothing to do with me. And I was saying, well, why do you think that? Well, because of some of the things I've done. Well, I didn't have to talk to that person about judgment. They'd already put themselves in the judgment box. Their challenge was actually that a God could forgive them. So, yeah, in a short, talk about it. Just be wise about how you talk about it and when you talk about it and the way that you do it. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, all right. Question from Victor here. Thank you, Andy. How does one apply this to family? It's hard to be a prophet in your hometown. Oh, Victor, what an absolutely great question. Thank you for that. And you're absolutely right to go, do you know, it's, it is... The further away you get socially from somebody, the easier it is, right? So in one sense, the random person you meet in the street or on the lineup at the coffee shop, that's quite easy. You may never see them again. The colleague, the classmate, if you're a student, a little bit harder, you're going to see them more often. Family gets really tricky. And say if it's a spouse, a husband or a wife who you see literally every day, or if you're living with, with somebody, much much harder and i feel that because i have um i have two family members i have my, bro my brother and sister uh one of them is ag agnostic maybe um or certainly very struggling with faith and one would say they're an atheist i think what i'd say victor is just again firstly be, be praying um that undergirds all of what we said this evening really so there's a real spiritual discipline i think in praying regularly for people so make a list of people like family members people who are close to you want to see a breakthrough stick that in the front of your bible pray frequently for opportunities then what i'd be doing is is looking again for perhaps some of those wandering type questions so if you've had sort of tried to have conversations with, with your family they haven't started before be on the lookout be attuned for places where you know your family member your brother sister parents whoever it is um you know expresses a passion for something or an interest in something and just look for a way to ask one of those wandering questions. I mean, I had a, it wasn't a, a family member, but I had a friend for years who tried to brush off, you know, God questions. And then finally, I remember he, noticing he had an Amnesty International sticker on the back of his car. And I asked a wandering question, you know, have you, have, I've often wondered why are you, you know, why are you passionate about, about justice given that I don't, you know, you, you don't believe in God as far as I'm aware. And that opened the conversation up. So it might be a case, Victor, of looking for the right, the right way, the right way in. Um, I think the, ch the two challenges with family are is one being too too much on the front foot that you're always in their face, and that you know that can cause relational issues. The other danger is to say nothing, to be afraid of saying stuff because they're family. And I think it's prayerfully and uh, with with the wisdom of the spirit trying to navigate between those two positions. I hope some of that some of that help, but I do appreciate. That, uh, that family can be tough. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, question from Isaac. Thank you, Andy and Apologia, for this opportunity. What distinguishes responsible sharing of the gospel from futile efforts? How can one discern when to persist and when to follow Jesus' guidance to shake the dust off your feet and move on? Mm. Wow, what an, what an astonishingly... Oh, gosh, there are some good questions. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs> it's really a tough good. one. <laughs> it's a tough one because actually once you partly answered it because you do need to be attuned to the, the spirit i'm constantly reminded that evangelism is a spiritual discipline you know sometimes for those of us who love apologetics we can be tempted a bit too much to make it about method and technique and and those are good to learn those things but there's a spiritual discipline too isn't there of listening to the the, the spirit um you know it's interesting i'm we're reading through the book of acts with our kids uh, in family bible time in the mornings we just came to that passage in i think it's act 16 the um where the holy spirit prevents paul and silas going into the province of asia really interesting passage the holy spirit is like nope no further so sometimes it can be obvious um 
So I think that that's the first thing. I, I think to be aware of that spiritually and to be asking the Lord that question uh, as you pray over conversations. You can also examine your own heart. I found Isaac sometimes and go, sometimes I have caught myself wanting to win an argument rather than win a person. And I think it'd be helpful to just try and discern whether that's going on. Sometimes talking to a fellow Christian friend can help. You can say, hey, can I just tell you about a conversation I'm having? And can you, I get your advice. Do you think I'm literally just trying to win a point or am I missing something here? And the other thing you can do, by the way, is yes, you can there's the shake your dust off, the dust off the feet and sort of walk away. There can also be, and this applies sometimes to the family issue that Victor raised. If it's a close friend that you can't sort of literally, you know, shake your feet to them and walk away, Sometimes actually just naming the issue and go, look, I'm, I'm really sorry this has become a heated conversation. Um, you know, I'm really passionate about my faith, as you, as you know. I know you think differently. I'm really sorry if I've upset you. Why don't we just leave this for now? Let's talk about the soccer um, or something else. Let's just leave it and, and move on. Uh, and sometimes being willing to apologize uh, can actually open things up again, or it can just defuse it and come back to it. Uh, but in all of that, just be praying and uh, and trying to sense what, what God is saying there. And if say, always I'm a believer in evangelism. If you make a mistake, nothing is irredeemable. Pray over it, you know, so, say to the Lord, I'm sorry I messed that one up and apologize to the person. If you've accidentally caused gratuitous offense, you know, it's amazing what being humble in our approach to people can do. Mm. Thanks. Anders uh, raises a question that I think... Uh, it's probably near the top of the list that the people are afraid to get asked. And that's how do you deal with, with questions on your view of LGBT uh, issues? Yeah. What an amazing, I didn't catch the name of the person who asked that. Uh, Andish. Andish. Okay. What a, what, what a brilliant question. And again, a very, a very contemporary uh, question. Um, mm. One thing I've tried to do here, I mean, there's, there's so much that could be, could be said here and as you say it's that uh, perhaps the issue a lot of christians are uh, are afraid of there's a number of ways of, of approaching it um if the person you're talking to you know is located within the lgbt community and you happen to know that and they're coming from that background one wandering question i found interesting is to say hey have you ever wondered why we treat sex and sexuality as something sacred um because look we may disagree on some things you and i but what we actually have in common is we all think that sex and sexuality really, really matters. I think it really matters because I think God created it and has a design for human flourishing. But I'd be interested to hear why you think sex really matters. It's clearly to you more than just a preference. You know, if you say to me, I like Star Trek and I go, I don't like Star Trek, don't worry. But if you say I belong, I'm LGBT and I go, oh, I don't agree with all of that, then there's a tension. Why do you think sex matters? That can be really interesting because again, you're turning the table slightly. And you're starting, you're getting onto their position is the first thing. Secondly, I think the other thing that can really matter, help here is the perception sometimes from our friends in the LGBT community is that Christians hate them uh, or that we have, you know, hyper restrictive views of sex and sexuality and, and everything else. All we want to do is restrict people. And I think anything that can bring us back to the narrative of going, look, one of my concerns about LGBT issues is to me, they distract us from the main thing. Which I think the most important thing is Jesus and who he is and the fact that he wants us to flourish and live the life that he intended for us. So, look, I am not an expert on sexuality. I would far rather talk about Jesus and who he is. And look, if someone commits to following Christ, changes will come because he is Lord and I'm not. But that's not for me to stand here and tell you what those changes would or wouldn't be if you follow Jesus. That, again, you can defer it slightly and put the spotlight back onto Jesus. And then the third thing that can be done that I think is incredibly helpful is to be aware of the stories and the testimonies of Christians who are same-sex attracted or have wrestled with gender issues, but are faithfully following the biblical teaching on sexuality and flourishing. So one of the biggest resources that I've come across recently that's really, really helpful, there's the uh, Living Out website. Uh, that's a gr group of you folks in the UK um, a lot of them are, uh, are pastors and Christian leaders who are often, in many cases, same-sex attracted, but are following Bible's teaching on, on, on sexuality. And all those, all their testimonies on that website are about how that just leads to incredible flourishing, how actually Jesus is the best news ever. Because as several of my friends on that website would say, one of the lies, I think, that, that our culture tells us about sex is that sex is the best thing ever. The most important thing as a human being is to have sex with somebody 
But actually, the message of the of Christianity is no. The most important thing, the best thing ever, is intimacy with Christ. Is knowing Jesus, and that transcends everything else. But if your person you are talking to thinks that sex is the most important thing, then you are going to talk past each other. So trying to navigate some of some of those things uh, and being willing to perhaps you know use the Jesus way, ask a question, redirect the conversation slightly can be incredibly helpful. And as I say, have a look at Living Out. It's, uh, I think you may find it very, very helpful uh, in some of its resources there. Hmm. Great. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, question from, uh, from Klaus. My experience is that the best conversation with coworkers is how when you go out for an after work, uh, something to drink helps weeds talk. <laughs> uh, but how do you do it at, during lunch or a coffee break where you have just a short time, you know, a few minutes or so? Yeah, well, I, I would say that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Maybe maybe the Swedes take shorter lunch breaks that we tend to have <laughs> you know, at least kind of half an hour ones here. Um, I just a couple of thoughts very practically. One is, you know, use the time wisely. I'm a great believer in the more that you take an interest in other people, the more they'll take an interest in, in you is the first thing. So if you've got a short time, just take an interest in your colleague. You know, if you've only got five, 10 minutes over, over a sandwich, but you know you've got a chance perhaps next month to see them down, uh, for something longer, um you know just take an interest find out how their life is going how the family is what's going on um sometimes actually by the way amazing coincidences happen there i've occasionally had situations where you know as you build a friendship with somebody they open up about something okay well actually it's not going so well right now you know my mother's really sick with cancer right now you know sometimes there are opportunities simply to go hey, i'm really sorry to hear that it must be so tough look i'm a i'm a christian mate would you mind if i prayed sometimes actually just offering prayer um can be an amazing uh opportunity to 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 interject the gospel into situations so you can you can take you can do that and by the way if you take an interest in your friend probably they'll take an interest in you and look for ways to one of my friends uh uses okay, introduced me to a lovely phrase which is fly faith flag find little ways in short conversations to just briefly signal that you're a christian in a non low key way really good example is one of the very brief conversations that always happens in UK workplaces. I'm sure it's probably similar in Sweden. Is on Monday morning you have the "What did you do on the weekend?" conversation. Someone's like, "How was your weekend?" And as Christians, we can sometimes duck church. You know, we get a bit nervous, so we talk about our Saturdays and all the fun things we did. We talk about the family lunch and the you know the, the football game we played on Sunday afternoon, but we neglect to mention church. Don't do that. Talk about your wonderful Saturday and all the fun things you did. You can say, well, I went to church on Sunday. It was brilliant. It's great to hang out with other followers of Jesus. The, the pastor preaches really thoughtful sermon. Still thinking about it. And then I went out and saw a movie on Sunday night. It's a great weekend. What you've done is you just, you've just signaled, I'm a normal person. I play sport. I go to the movies. I have friends. And I go to church. And I talk about it in a very positive way. And uh, if you keep doing that, then uh, you are sowing down lots of future potential for people picking up on conversations. You're sort of a, you know sowing the, sowing the seed. For deeper conversations so just use the time wisely but don't try and overload it if you've got five minutes to buy a sandwich don't try and have a massive conversation on the meaning of life in the sandwich queue <clears throat> anna asks um thank you for an encouraging talk i find myself frozen at times when atheists around me just burst out something downgrading about the the christian faith in general so so not directed to me or at me personally Often these questions are rhetorical and seem to not expect an answer, mm -hmm. which stresses me out and leaves me uh, frozen. So how would you uh, Sorry to hear that, respond Anna. to that? <laughs> Sorry to hear that, Anna. Well, I'd say, uh, I'd say a couple of things. Firstly, if you find yourself freezing and getting nervous, can I recommend, if, if you haven't already, try and find a Christian friend that you can buddy up with. If there's someone else at your workplace, that can help. If not, if there's someone in your church, a friend, that you can share some of those workplace experiences and pray with, because that can really help us, knowing that there's others praying for us in our workplace. So, so share those stories, be encouraged. But the other thing you can do with rhetorical questions, if you think that someone's asking you a question, just making a statement that they don't really want an answer to, sometimes actually naming that can be really interesting. You know, with a, with a little twinkle in your eye, a little smile, just saying, well, that's a fascinating statement. Tell me, do you really want an answer to that? In which case, I'm very happy to have a, a conversation, a serious conversation. Or are you just wanting to just be funny? In which case, let's just move on, because quite frankly, it wasn't that funny. Um, someone's actually naming it. The secret is doing it in a friendly way. If you do it in an aggressive kind of way, then it can it can escalate. But if you just name it, 
Um, by the way, this also works with serious questions. If somebody asks you a serious question, uh, I don't know about, about you, but sometimes I've, I've had atheist friends who keep asking question after question. I've learned sometimes to say, you know, that's a really good question that you ask there. Tell me, if I answered it for you to your satisfaction, would you become a Christian? And if they say no, that's interesting because you can say, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. What is the question that if I answered it, you would consider following Jesus? Because that's the question I want to answer. And of course, if they say yes, um, then you've kind of called their bluff. And they, by all means, uh -huh. you know, work hard at answering the question. But digging into why they answer, they ask it. And actually, as an aside, I've actually sometimes find that interesting on, on lots of questions. When someone raises you, asks you a question, if you want breathing space, sometimes looking at your friends saying, that's a great question. Why do you ask it? can be very helpful just slowing the conversation down slightly because there's often a story behind every question even the rhetorical ones you know you could say to your friend hey you keep throwing these rhetorical atheist things at me why is that why do you talk so much about god for someone who doesn't doesn't believe in him you know i, I i'm not a buddhist but i don't go around throwing rhetorical anti-buddhist questions around the office what is it that fascinates you about christian faith because it does fascinate me that some atheists do go on and on and on and on <laughs> about a God they claim uh -huh. not believing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, question from Betiel here. How um, how do you, um, let's see how I want to translate this. Uh, how do you learn or how do you, I guess, uh, what approach should you have to apologetics as a, a high school youth? So a, a teenager, like what? What would your approach be? Where yeah. do you get started? And yeah. Oh, fantastic. Bethel, what a, what a wonderful question. So, um, well, I, when I got started, I got started a bit later than high school. I got started in my, in my late twenties after leaving the hospital and realizing I needed help. Um, I think a great starting point is to look around at, at your friends and figure out what are the issues in my, in my friendship group, because I want to reach the people God's put in front of me. So there's no point going and reading, you know, lots of books on the apologetics of Hinduism if, if there's no Hindus in your in your life. So don't 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 do that. And I just realized I've got the Apple feature on where it does strange things. I thought my Apple <laughs> comes up, it just gave me a, an icon. That's very clever. Um, Someone approved. I know. I was going to say, I, I was, <laughs> it keeps turning it so off and I forget to turn it off and it disconcerts me. Um, so that's the first thing. So, so see what uh, your friends are into. Um, secondly, I would recommend before you dig too deeply into like the more serious apologetic stuff, I think um, doing a little bit of reading on some of the practical stuff on how you have conversations with people, um, because I meet a lot of, uh, you know, younger people, high school students, and university students who who have overdosed a little bit on, you know, really heavy uh, books on the arguments for the Christian faith. And, that, and that's great. Those are great resources. But if you haven't learned how to have natural conversations, um, you're going to struggle a little bit. So obviously, there's the book we're talking about about this evening. Um, there's books like a friend of mine uh, called Randy Newman wrote a great book called uh, Questioning Evangelism. Uh, I'm not sure if that's in Swedish, but if you're uh, if you're understanding this in English, you'd be fine with Randy's book. <laughs> there are others, you know, we could mention. If you go to the Solas website, we've got a lot of stuff on this this too. I'll put a link into the uh, the chat in a moment. We're running a series on the Solas website this year called uh, Launchpad. We have every week we've got a new idea. Uh, for evangelism to get you started in evangelism so so learning those skills um, would be a great place to begin so look at what what your what are the issues the questions that your friends have what the issues are there and then learn some basic conversational skills and then take it take it from there mm. and and i could add as well betiel um you know do uh do get in touch with us at apologia we have resources in swedish some specifically for kind of the high school age uh, and we're happy to visit youth groups and such in, in churches as well. So, so do get in touch Excellent. with us uh, again after tonight. Well, thank you so much, Andy. This has been really interesting, really helpful, very practical. And, and uh, I'm seeing lots of uh, appreciative uh, comments here in the chat as well. So, so thank you so much for coming on and being with us it's for this hour and a half. absolute pleasure, Martin, and thank you to all of you who, uh, who made time this evening. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, I really enjoyed hanging out, and thank you for your wonderful questions.